Hey everyone, good morning. Thank you for joining us at Grace Des Moines. Uh, we're just starting a couple minutes early now, hoping to catch folks and let everyone join in the fun. If we haven't met yet, my name is Nate Nims. I am flanked this morning by Selena and uh, Felix is hanging out in here with me and uh, Leo is having some fun in here as well. So if there's some animal noises, um, it is most likely this one that's chiming in. Selena's more vocal these days than she used to be. Uh, but thank you for joining us at Grace. It is uh, great to be with you all this morning. There are just a couple announcements as we get started. So, uh, you know, say hi to one another in the comments. Um, chime in as you need to during the service. Um, but there's just a couple things to lift up as we get started. Hey, Selena. Now, uh, I am wearing this bow tie because a number of you voted on it this week. Uh, we had a little poll where I put my, my bow ties out there, and you all said this was your favorite for this week. So we did this hoping that uh, we could raise some money for our assistance fund. Uh, we have an assistance fund at Grace that we usually use to help folks with gas or groceries, partnering with some other agencies and knowing what's available in our neighborhood in usual times that was the gap that we saw that we would help people with but since this isn't a usual time we're helping people in a couple different ways um right now we've helped a couple folks with rent we've helped people with utilities uh, we've helped people with groceries and household items as well so we're starting to use our assistance fund more and more and if you are a fan of this bow tie I would encourage you to make a donation to that assistance fund if you want to give online at gracedemoines.org and help us to give back to the community. That is a great way that you can do so. A second thing that I wanted to lift up as we get closer to April is that you may have noticed that Christmas is the same date every year, right? It's always December 25th, but April, April is not always when Easter happens. Easter jumps around. And Easter jumps around because in uh, 325, the Council of Nicaea decided that Easter would be held on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the spring equinox. There's a couple reasons for this. That is to keep Easter connected to uh, the Passover celebration, to keep us lined up with the Jewish calendar that Jesus would have known. It's also to remind us that when life is springing back in spring, that the same spirit and energy in God brings us back to life as well. That as life springs forth from the earth, we celebrate the resurrection that makes all that possible. Now, this year, the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, is Sunday, April 12th. Now, the, the current disaster protocol that the governor put in place says that gatherings of more than 10 should not happen before April 16th. There is a chance that schools will open before that, but at the moment, things are kind of on hold and in flux. And so I wanted to let you know where that is bringing us to this year as we get closer to Easter. What we're, what we're leaning towards right now, what my goal is, is that we will celebrate Easter one way or another on the 12th. April 12th is Easter this year, and we're going to celebrate Easter together. And at the moment, that celebration will be online. But eventually, we will come back together in worship. We will be a community in our congregation, in our sanctuary. And at that moment, we will celebrate Easter as well, because that will be a moment of resurrection. When we've made it through this together, because we've supported one another, we will come back on whatever that first date back is and celebrate resurrection because we're witnessing it with one another. So that's, that's our plan. Things are up in the air as the cases of COVID-19 continue to be in flux, as there are more uh, things up in the air. We'll, we'll see what our first date back is but I'm holding on to that first date back as our celebration of resurrection because that's what we'll witness with one another. So until we get to that date, though, keep reaching out to one another. It has been great to hear of the ways that you are helping and making a difference in the community. 
Um, some people are sending me pictures of things going on in their neighborhood, of ways that people are reaching out to one another. Um, Dan and Mary Paulson sent me a letter, and it had this giant smiley face in it yesterday, and I just couldn't help but smile when I opened it. So keep reaching out to one another, keep spreading that, that grace and peace, keep sharing this love with one another, and um, we'll, we'll be grace until we are at grace again. So with that, uh, we'll just take a moment now in silence to center ourselves, to catch our breath, and to come together in this moment where God is already with us, and we can remember that there is grace and peace with and for each one of us and everyone else. So let's, let's take a moment of silence, then we'll pray and uh, dig into our lesson on the Sermon on the Mount this morning. So let's, let's take that moment of silence together now. Let's pray. God, you invite us into your presence. Weary or heavy laden, we dwell in the presence of the divine. We come together with grief or with anger or with fear or with hopes or with dreams or with love, trusting that everything that we bring is welcome here. As we gather to proclaim and hear the good news, help us to know that we are set free. May we believe that love is yet alive and that there is a spirit stirring among us. Open our hearts and our minds so that we might be renewed together. Amen. Now our our reading this morning comes from the Sermon on the Mount. We are in Matthew chapter 6, looking at verses 7 through 15 this morning. Uh, If you've been with us at Grace for a while, you know that we are journeying through the Sermon on the Mount, looking at this teaching from Christ and trying to apply it to our lives and learn what it means to follow him and his ways. So let's read now from Matthew 6, verses 7 through 15. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your God knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways that we have wronged you just as we forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us in temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly God will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will God forgive your sins. So we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. I'm glad Selena is very popular. Um, she's, she's hanging out with us, aren't you, Kitty? And as St. Francis would say, preach always and, and welcome the animals too. So we've been, we've been journeying through the Sermon on the Mount, looking at these uh, teachings and these words from Christ, seeing how the sermon builds and develops. Because often, at first look, the Sermon on the Mount seems like this meandering and wandering passage that just jumps from one place to another. But if you've been with us, you've seen how the Sermon on the Mount builds and grows and develops. If you have missed any of the teachings that we've had on this, you can look them up on our Facebook page. They're also on our website, and we just put up a YouTube page as well to continue sharing these videos in a different way. So the last two weeks are up there along with a few other videos And the digital hymn sing that we had last week is on that YouTube page as well. So last week, we looked at what Jesus meant when he said, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In that teaching last week, we saw that Jesus is showing us how we grow and develop. That things uh, go from uh, being new to normal to second nature. That when we are just beginning, when we are getting started and learning, everything is new and different. So things can be frustrating and difficult, and they don't come naturally because it's not normal yet. 
And yet, as we grow and develop, as we, we learn, we develop new patterns and habits that become normal for our lives, and they, they become our second nature, just like, just like riding a bike, right? When you first learn how to ride a bike, you think about every step that you have to take. You have to think about how to pick one foot up off the ground, how to put your other foot on the pedal, how to keep your balance, how to hold the handlebars. When you first learn how to ride a bike, you have to think and process through each one of those moments. But eventually it becomes normal, it becomes routine, it becomes habit, and you don't have to think about it anymore because it's your second nature. Now in times like this, when everything is a bit in flux, when the world is shifting and every day is a different news report, we don't know what normal is, it's hard to find that natural flow to our lives. We, we don't have that new normal just yet. Maybe we've got hints and guesses at what that looks like, but things are continuing to flow and develop and become new for us. Now, we, we have to remember that because this is new, it's not normal, it's not our second nature yet. We're beginners, we're learners, so we've got to be patient with ourselves. We have to be patient with one another. No one expects someone, the first time they learn something, to be an expert at it. So as we learn in this time what it means to love ourselves, God, and one another, we have to be patient with ourselves. That, that is very comforting to remember that we, we have to be patient. We have to have understanding for ourselves and one another. And yet, as comforting as, as that is, we have to also remember that when things are new, when they're different, when it's not normal yet, when everything is in flux, that can be really frustrating and confusing and lead to some anxiety as well. I was thinking back to my time as a uh, peewee baseball player this week. Now when I was growing up I played t-ball and then we uh, grew up into coach pitch baseball and eventually players got to pitch to other players. Now when I was young I really loved playing baseball and I, I got put in left field because I'm the kind of person that, that um, I get distracted. I'll admit that. Um, so I was put in left field because in left field, I could, you know, observe what people were doing in the stands, and I could watch cars go by, and I could see the other players on the bench, and the odds of me having to pay close attention all the time were very low. But eventually, there was a moment where I would pay co close attention, and that one was when I was at bat. I loved batting practice, and I loved being at bat during the game. And when you're playing t-ball or when you're playing coach pitch baseball, it's really easy to be a good batter because the odds of you getting on base are extremely high. And the odds of you making contact with the ball are almost 100%. So I, I loved that. But even when we switched to pitching with the, the teams, when it was no longer coach pitch and it was now students pitching to other students, I still loved being at bat until one game. There was one game where I got hit by a wild pitch at my first at bat. And I brushed it off thinking to myself, well, everyone's new to this. We're still trying to figure out how to play baseball. That's, that's just part of the game. I'll, I'll go on with it. And then I got hit with the second pitch. And I thought, okay, maybe this wasn't an accident. And then I got hit by one more pitch. In one game, I got hit by three pitches, and I thought to myself, I don't like playing baseball anymore. <laughs> Maybe this game is not for me on the field. That is one of my most vivid childhood memories of sports, being hit by three wild pitches in one day and thinking to myself, I don't want to do this anymore. Now, if, if the Nate that I am right now went back in time and spoke to little Nate and said, don't worry, kid, you're all new to this, you'll learn, it will become new, 
but it'll become natural, and then it'll be second nature. If I went back and told Nate, just, just stick in there, you'll get used to it. Nate back then would have said, if I have to get used to hit, being hit by baseballs, I don't want to do this anymore. Right? There are some things that we don't want to become normal. There are things that we don't want to be natural. We all have those moments where we are so frustrated or anxious or worried rather than wanting to learn a new way forward we just want to take a nap we just want to throw in the towel and say i'm done like i i don't know about you all but in these days i have been more exhausted than i should be you know there there are nights where I, I can barely stay awake until 9 p.m. And I retrace my steps for the day. And those steps are like waking up, sitting at the kitchen table, sitting in this chair, and then sitting on our living room couch, writing emails, reading bo books, making phone calls, writing sermons. I am not doing anything physically difficult right now. There is nothing that is draining my energy. And yet, I am just drained. Because, in all honesty, that's what stress will do to us. It, it takes our energy. And when we are beginners, when we're learners, when we're stressed and frustrated, when we're trying to discover what it means for us to love God and love one another in this new time, as we try to love ourselves, we feel frustration and anxiety and fears in completely new and different ways. And there's not a normal that we can fall back on because we haven't discovered our new normal yet. A lot of times, especially now, we find ourselves confusing our capacity for love and understanding and mercy from the well that we should draw from. I, I don't know how you all are dealing with this moment, but for myself, I know that if I can only rely on my own love, on my own understanding, on my own mercy, I am not going to make it very far and I will keep finding new gray hairs. For some reason, a lot of my new gray hairs are showing up in this eyebrow, disproportionate to this one, and that's adding to the stress of this moment because I don't understand what's going on with my own hair even, right? There are all sorts of things that are in chaos and confusion. We are trying to find a new way forward, and when we don't know what the next day will bring, it's hard, and we have to admit that. Too often, we confuse our capacity for love with the well that we can draw from. That's why after Jesus teaches us what it looks like to grow, after Jesus begins this Sermon on the Mount telling us that we are blessed and we are beloved no matter what we have done, no matter what has been done to us, after Jesus says that we are salt and light, after Jesus says this is who you are, after Jesus reminds us of this divine call on our lives to love and share grace and peace, after talking us up and telling us exactly who God knows we are, Jesus teaches us how to pray because Jesus needs us to refill ourselves. If we are pouring ourselves out, if we are emptying ourselves, if we are giving the good gift that God knows that we are to one another, if we are being a blessing in this life, pouring ourselves out, we have to remember there is a time to be refilled. That's why Jesus teaches us to pray. Now, when you think about prayer, what sorts of, of words or images come to mind? For you. When I think of prayer, the first image that comes to mind for me is a painting that was up in my grandparents' home. It was similar to the paintings of Jesus that are behind me from that same era. But it was this painting of a man sitting at a table, getting ready to eat. He had bread and he had his hands clasped and he was praying. That's, that's an image of prayer that has always struck with me. Or maybe, 
Maybe if you don't imagine prayer like that, if that's not the word or image that comes to mind, when you hear prayer, maybe you think of monks or nuns in a monastery somewhere separating themselves from the world so they can spend their life in prayer. Or maybe, maybe when you hear the word prayer these days, you imagine the televangelists that somehow find themselves on TV calling us to pray as a nation because they believe this is somehow God's anger poured out on us. Prayer is a tricky word, right? Because we all have this longing, this connection to reach out to the divine, to find this hope that is bigger than us. We, we have this longing within us. We need prayer. And at its best, prayer is as sweet as a peach, but it can also be as hard as the pit, right? It is a struggle to, to find the words and the images that make prayer what God wants for us. So as I, as I was thinking about prayer this week, I thought of St. Patrick and the story of his life. St. Patrick's Day was just a couple weeks ago, and if you ever venture out to pick up more toilet paper, you can get a lot of St. Patrick's Day supplies on a very steep discount. Now, St. Patrick is the apostle of Ireland, right? He is celebrated as the, the saint of the Irish people, and it's celebrated so much so because St. Patrick lived in a time where Irish Catholic was not a phrase that made sense. So Patrick grew up in England. He was a child there, and in his teens, sometime around 16 is our best guess, uh, Patrick was kidnapped by Irish pirates. So if you want to imagine what Irish pirates were like, think of Bono with a parrot on his shoulder and an eye patch. So St. Patrick was kidnapped by Bono, he was kidnapped by Irish pirates, and then taken to Ireland where he was enslaved for the next six years of his life. He was held captive, and he was made to work in a kitchen and do odd jobs around this little farmhouse. And he, in this captivity, spent a lot of time in prayer. He spent a lot of time seeking mercy and grace and understanding for himself. He sought forgiveness so that he could forgive those that captured him. He began to see God in his everyday moments of life. He saw God in all that he did and all around him. He just started to pay attention through prayer. Now, after about six years of captivity, St. Patrick had this vision of a ship waiting for him at the shore. He heard a voice that seemed to tell to him, go to the shoreline and board this ship and go home. He saw this ship in his mind's eye. He heard a voice telling him to go, and so he left. He walked 200 miles in 28 days because he had this vision of a ship waiting for him. And eventually, he found that ship waiting for him at the shore, just like he had saw in his mind's eye, and he sailed back to England. In England, he, he studied, he went back to school, he became a priest, and then eventually sailed back to Ireland to become a missionary to the people there. Now, you could imagine all the sort of frustration that Patrick might have had because he was going back as a missionary to the people that had kidnapped him. You could imagine the sort of wrath and the anger that missionaries can preach and how Patrick could have taken advantage of that. But that's not what he did. When Patrick went back to Ireland, he told people, God is already with you. You just don't know God by name. He showed people in their life, in their interactions with one another, where faith was found. And maybe the most famous moment of that in Patrick's life was when he held up a three-leaf clover and he said, this is what God is like, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer, all in this one clover leaf together. So when Patrick taught people to pray, he taught people a very special way to pray. If you're not sure how to pray, Maybe, maybe try this during the week. Patrick would tell people, imagine you're hanging out in your garden. And in those days, everybody had a garden because there weren't grocery stores, right? So imagine, imagine you're in the garden and Jesus is there. 
And Jesus is there with the disciples. Now, when Francis told people, not Francis, when Patrick told people to imagine that Jesus was there with the disciples, he meant the 12 closest followers that Jesus had, but he also meant Mary and Martha, the other women that supported him. Jesus also meant the writers of the New Testament. Patrick wanted to imagine you in a garden with all of these saints that have gone before you, with this whole community of faith gathered together. When Patrick told people how to pray, he said, imagine Jesus is in your garden. Imagine Jesus is in your yard talking with your family and friends. What are they talking about? When, when St. Patrick taught people how to pray, that's where Patrick started with our imagination, with putting Jesus in our lives, and then asking us, what do you think Jesus would be talking about right now? What do you think Jesus would be having a conversation about? Maybe that's where we can start our prayer. Prayer, at its best, it should cut through the noise and the fear of our egos and point us towards the ever-present conversation that we are having with the divine. Now, before Jesus teaches us how to pray, Jesus says, when you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying their many words, they will be heard. Don't be like them because your God knows what you need before you ask. According to Jesus, prayer is not a checklist of things that we need to go through. It is not us seeking to achieve or accomplish something. Whatever we need, whatever we ask, God already knows. For Jesus, it seems that prayer is less something that we do as a ritual or routine. It is more a reality that we embody and live out. In Greek, the word for babbling on is uh, batalegeo, and it means to like bubble and blubber on with words of nonsense. And sometimes think about it like this. Have you ever had a friend that needed a favor? And so they took you out for coffee, they paid for your drink, and they started to talk about a number of other things, but you knew that they were going to ask for a favor, and in your head the whole time they're buttering you up, you're thinking, I really wish you would just get to the point. Right? Like, we, we don't need to blubber on because God already knows. Prayer isn't about bringing to God something that God is not aware about. It's about refilling ourselves and our spirits with this love that is always with us. So in our reading this morning, Jesus tells us before we pray what we know is the Lord's Prayer, that God knows what we need before we ask. The essence of prayer. Sometimes we get confused with the mechanics of prayer. The mechanics are the words and the phrases and the practices, the way that we fold our hands, the way that we tilt our heads down. Before I pray, I almost always cross my forehead, remembering that I've been baptized and beloved. We, we have all of these different styles of prayer, but we should not confuse those styles and those mechanics of prayer with what the essence of prayer is. The essence of prayer is this ongoing conversation that we have with God, resting in this love that is already with us. When Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, Jesus teaches us to see prayer in a new light, to let ourselves be refilled with grace and peace. Now, like, like the disciples, sometimes we think that we don't know what to pray, that we don't have the words to say, and that's, that's okay. If, if you're not sure what to pray, think about prayer like this. If you're reading books right now, like a number of us are, and if you're the person, um, I'm one of those persons that I write in book margins, I underline passages, Maybe you do that too. Now, if you have reread a book recently that you read before, you might have underlined something that when you read it the first time, it was profound and you wanted to star it. 
But then you read it again now, another passage jumped out. Something else came to mind and inspired you. It's not that the words in the book have changed. It's that you have changed. Prayer is not the words that we use. It's, it's the images. It's the, the connection that we have with God. They are excavation tools that help us enter into this conversation that we're always having with God. We, we pray all the time. We are always connected with God. There are different words or phrases or practices that help us enter into that presence, that bring that awareness to our mind. But God is never far from us because as Jesus says, God already knows. So if you're not sure how to pray, think about it like St. Patrick. Imagine Jesus is hanging out in your garden with your friends and family and the disciples. What are they talking about today? Or if you're still not sure how to pray, think about your favorite song. The song that inspires you, that no matter where you are, when you hear it, you have to sing along. What is it about that song that brings your spirits back to life? What is it that uplifts you and inspires you? How has it taken a hold of you? And there, there are times when we pray that our words just come quickly, that we, we flow, but other times we just don't have our own words at all. So in the moments where you can't find any words for yourself, what do the words of your favorite songs say? What do the words of your favorite poems say? What, what images, what words come to life in you? And could you bring those before God in prayer? Jesus says that we can also pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring your kingdom so that your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the times that we have wronged you. And just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly God will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your God forgive you. There's a lot of active words in that prayer, right? Like bring us, lead us, give us. We are asking God to provide something that we cannot provide ourselves. We're asking to be led in a certain direction because left to our own devices, we might go another way. We are being inspired to live a certain life that reflects God's love. As Christians, we don't just pray for ourselves and then go walk another path. We pray this prayer Jesus taught so that we can live into the kingdom that Jesus sought. Jesus invites us to pray for and then embody this love of God that is always with us, to be a people like Jesus that pray as we live and live as we pray, sharing with others the groundedness of the love of God that is already with us. Now of all that can and should be said about this prayer that Jesus teaches, there's one phrase that stuck out to me the most this week. And that's when Jesus says, God knows. There's so much that could be said about this prayer that Jesus teaches, but in a time of worry and uncertainty in days of disarray and confusion moving forward as we try to find a new normal as we try to adjust to this new life that we are going through together with everything that we don't know jesus says god knows god knows the prayer that i have said the most this week has simply been you already know, you already know, you already know. Sometimes the difference in our souls between feeling defeated and determined is a millimeter. And the way I keep stepping forward a millimeter at a time, it's not by falling back on my own strength or grace or love. It's by leaning into the love of the God 
that already knows. If you don't know what else to pray, saying to God, you already know, is enough. As the, the great poet Pablo Neruda put it, you can cut all of the flowers, but you cannot stop spring from coming. God already knows. Spring is coming. Resurrection is unfolding all around us. And as we look out on the world today, we can see this insistence, this persistence of a love and a life that will keep unfolding even without our own efforts and energies. There is a resurrection in this world that we observe, that we appreciate, that we are a part of because this energy of God makes everything possible. We cannot and we must not confuse our energy and our efforts and our love with the depths of love that God has because that is the well that we draw from. The depths of mercy that God has are far deeper than anything that I have on my own. God already knows. God is already with us, and God will renew us. By our efforts and by our energy, we will only get so far. And God already knows that. And the good news is that we can strive to te take every step forward possible. We, we can and we must reach out to one another to be a people of grace and peace and love. And yet, as much as we give, as much as we offer ourselves to one another, we have to receive. We have to be refilled. The great saint and mystic Teresa of Avila has a number of amazing prayers. And one of her prayers puts it like this. May you trust God that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith. May you use those gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content knowing that you are a child of God. Let this presence settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing and to dance and to praise and to love. It is there and in every one of us. You already know. You already know. You already know. Of everything that Jesus teaches about prayer this week, you already know has meant the world to me. Because God knows, and God is with us. And we, we don't have to do this on our own. By our own energy, by our own efforts, by our own love or mercy, we will only go so far. And God knows that. And God is there to refill us and renew us. God already knows. God is with you. You are beloved and you are blessed. And you need to relax. You need to rest. You need to let yourself be refilled and renewed. Come together with God in this moment as we, we come together in prayer now. We're, we're going to come together in prayer and we'll lift up those that we want and need to in the comments. Uh, remember that you can post uh, prayers in the comments. We'll be with one another in prayer that way. So feel free to write things out there. Um, as, as I think about prayers in our world and in our community, uh, for me especially, I'm thinking of Northeast Iowa right now. Um, there were a couple tornadoes and some strong winds that blew through that region of our state. And um, just people seem to re be recovering well, but um, yeah, they're, they're on my heart right now. Um, so whatever other comments and whatever other prayers you want to lift up, you can do so in the comments. Um, but we're going to join together with a prayer now that was written by Anna and M at Enfleshed. Um, their work has often been used in our liturgies at Grace, and uh, we'll post a link to their stuff in the comments. 
if you are interested in more of their work. Um, so let's, let's come together in prayers now. Divine Companion, when loved ones, strangers, and kin are tucked away in isolation, fighting for their breath and yearning for home, the chasm between us and them feels impossible to bear. Will you, sacred one, whisper to them the words of comfort we long to speak? Will you wrap your embrace around them as if our arms? Let their hands feel our gentle squeeze, their cheek our kiss, upon their chest a calming hand, a promise of our care through the rising and falling of each reach for life. Assure them of your love and of ours. Call for a holy cloud of witnesses to surround. Draw close every saint who knew and loved them. You do not abandon anyone to suffer alone. Where there is pain or fear or distress, you are already there. Willingly sharing our hardest hours. If death comes, welcome them gently into the fold of eternal love, where peace and rest await. For in life and in death, we take refuge in your presence that stretches across time and space, a sacred meeting place where we find each other, even when we are apart. May it be so. All this and all the prayers that are in our hearts, all that God already knows, all that we bring before our divine camp companion, this God that is already with us, everything that we have commented, everything that we sigh and can't yet say, for all that we have and for all that God already knows. Let us join together in the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you want to give to grace at this time, one of the best ways that you can do so is by giving online. Thank you to everyone that has done that. Uh, you can visit gracedemoines.org and give online there. And you can also uh, feel free to put checks in the mail and send them that, that way. Um, another way that you can support our church in addition to what we do financially is by offering ourselves to one another. Um, if our prayer is to be refilled and renewed, to find this grace and peace in our lives so that we can share grace and peace with one another, Think about how you can refill yourself this week. Or if you are quarantined with others, my guess is your home feels a little smaller than it used to. Your apartment might not be as spacious as it once was if you are sharing it with others. Something about staying together is lovely and yet keeps us close. So if you, if you need to think of ways that you can renew yourself. Also think of ways that you could offer renewal to someone else. How can you provide space and grace and peace? How can you be like Selena and just hang out and provide comfort and a calm presence? How, how can you find that renewal this week? Because we need that renewal. And the good thing is God already knows. Maybe you can go on a walk. Maybe you can work on a craft. Take a nap, listen to your favorite song, say a prayer, but do, do something to refill and renew yourself this week. Provide space to others and uh, find that space for yourself as well. So let yourself be refreshed and renewed so that you might be refilled by the God that already knows because God is with you. So may we all live with grace and peace.
thank you all for joining us again this week. We'll be posting videos throughout the week. Uh, feel free to keep commenting and we'll stay in touch that way as well. And if there's anything I can do, uh, feel free to email or uh, give me a call. We'll talk to you later. Thank you all so much for joining us and for, for having this connection with one another. Thank you for being a people that deserve to be called grace. We'll be with you again. Bye.